<clears throat> well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. So our lockdown's normal. Now, since March 2020, a temporary plan has evolved into something much, much more, not just here in the U.S., but across the globe. So joining me today to look at lockdowns, their cost, and the future is Jeffrey Tucker. Mr. Tucker is the editorial director for the American Institute for Economic Research. In addition, he is the author of a new book, Liberty or a Lockdown. Mr. Tucker, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for mentioning March, because that is the start of it. Unless you want to go back a month earlier where Trump banned travel from China. Maybe that should be the beginning of the lockdown. <laughs> okay, well, let's do that. So you, you have been... We, you have been looking at lockdowns for months now. So I saw one of your articles that was very interesting, and you kind of look at the history of this stuff. You know, does this even make any sense? What is the history of this type of mitigation and others that we're seeing, face mask and, and the like? Now, they're all called NPIs, or non-pharmaceutical interventions, and all these terms like targeted layered containment and um, social distancing all date from 2006, really, and really 2005. And w w what happened here was that George W. Bush was president, and you recall he became a bit of an apocalyptic um, after 9-11, you know? He was, he was a kind of a, he, he came into office as sort of a, you know, um, uh, I don't know what you would call, like a Coolidge kind of figure, you know, just a good old boy and just glad to have a good time and that sort of thing. Um, if, if only. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, had a reputation of being a drunk again, if only. Um, but um, after 9-11, he kind of shaped up and got serious, you know, became adult. It was like adulting time. And then he became seriously paranoid about biochemical warfare, blowback from, from his wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was about the same time that there was a sort of a, a tendency within the epidemiological communities to uh, start to focus and think about um, the use of computer modeling for the purpose of disease mitigation. And so it was kind of a perfect storm. So Bush calls this White House event and, and, and taps, you know, the state because the president always gets his way. What are we going to do about biochemical warfare? So he calls the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, uh, you know, sends out, a, you know, a big, a big broadcast, for, you know, CDC, everybody. Oh, I need to know what we should do in the event of a new virus. And um, so there was a big clash, there was a big conference at the White House and a big clash, really, at, at that year between the uh, modelers, the new modelers on the block. And they'd only been around for about four years. Uh, these are not medical professionals. You know, they hadn't had any experience in virus mitigation or, 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 or uh, epidemic management or anything like that. They were just people who uh, imagined they could use computers to um, model a virus spread and how to prevent it. So they had both met at the White House. One was one team was led by Donald Henderson, who's very famous for the eradication of smallpox. Right. And um, and a kind of an old school guy, you know, he traveled all over the world. He's the head of the World Health Organization. He really knew his stuff. And then there was all these other people that were sort of new, experiencing new levels of funding from the from the Gates Foundation and really attached to programming and models. And Neil Ferguson was one of the top people, you know, from the UK and the Imperial College in the U.S. The guy who took the lead on this, his name was uh, Philip. Uh, uh, a glass and his daughter Sarah, and what happened in that case? He was over at Sandia National Laboratories in in New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he was racking his brain like, "Oh, what is the answer to a virus? What should we do for the virus?" And his daughter, who was fourteen, fifteen, uh, was involved in a science uh, fair project, in which, which she she came up with a model by which everybody just stays uh, uh, apart from each other six feet and don't get anywhere near each other. They can't infect each other. It was kind of what, what I would consider like a cooties model of virus mitigation. <laughs> it's like, stay away, stay away, stay away. Playground stuff, you know? <laughs> and he thought, oh, sweetheart, that's a, a, a wonderful idea. Which I understand, by the way. I have daughters, and I, I know how it is as a father. You want to flatter your, your children, you know, with their... Yeah. So he made her the co-author of the, really, I think, the very first paper on social distancing. It was published in 2006. There wasn't an end game. If you read that paper, it's very interesting. It's like how to stop the spread, you know, how to uh, avoid the virus. There wasn't anything about what would happen to the virus, you know. Uh, that wasn't in there. Like, well, 
this you know viruses don't work at, like on a computer you can't just buy um you know mcafee uh, program and stop them from infecting your hard drive and you're done with them you know that's not the way viruses work i mean they could you could we can't you live with viruses you know we've lived with them for millions of years and so the, there was one of the real faults of this paper that it didn't seem to have any medical knowledge but here's what's was fascinating about this whole experience at the white house you had two teams one the doctors and one the modelers and the, the doctors had a kind of fairly boring presentation. It's like, what do you do when the, vi when the pathogen comes? And I said, well, you know, you need to figure it out. You need to figure out if it's mild or if it's moderate or if it's critical, severe. And then you figure out who the affected population is, what the consequences are. Now, there's a trade-off between severity and prevalence. So sometimes a really, really bad virus will burn itself out really quickly. Other times a really good virus will spread throughout the whole population, but its effects will be mild. Unless it's for a certain targeted group, I figure out who those are. By this time, George Bush and all the all, the, all of his uh, White House bureaucrats are, are bored out of their minds. Right? This is the most boring presentation they've ever heard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so next up was uh, Robert and Sarah Glass, right? And um, and and all the modeling people. And they they had PowerPoint presentations and 3D models, and you know people moving this way and that way, and and how they're going to close the schools, and then they're going to have rolling uh, targeted layer containment, you know, within within large large groups, and stop travel, and all these things. And and in their model, the virus just evaporates, you know. And and George Bush is like, no, that's what I'm going for here. You know, that sounds a lot like that sounds a lot like what I did in Iraq. You know, that's that's a winning <laughs> strategy. So he goes to the CDC and says, write this into uh, our our disease planning. Well, meanwhile. The doctors, you know, were just furious. They're like, who are these freaks that are taking over our profession? This is just really weird. There's a huge knockdown, you know, attack. Uh, Donald Henderson wrote, wrote one with two co-authors. It was just basically, uh, this, is, this is insane. Masks don't work. Travel restrictions don't mitigate viruses. Quarantines will discriminate against the poor. You're going to disrupt society and create a larger costs uh, down the road. And this is not the way you handle a virus. Well, uh, they basically lost because the CDC wrote these targeted layer containments into its uh, disease planning, including uh, quarantines. As far as I know, this was never voted on by Congress. And it was in 2006 when I discovered that this that the plans for large scale quarantine were in place and they were almost deployed that year with the avian bird flu, which they might have been, except that the avian bird flu only got birds sick and <laughs> nobody else. So that didn't work. That was, a Neil, no, that was another Neil Ferguson thing, right? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's, he's predicted millions of dead with every kind of uh, uh, animal followed by the yeah. word flu. You, know, you can imagine mad, mad cow, mad crow, I don't know, everything. But, um, <laughs> but uh, 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 and then 2009 came and went with H1N1, which was kind of a scary one. And then uh, 2002, 2003 came and went. Um, with SARS-CoV-1, you know, but that never reached the U.S. and the World Health Organization took a great credit for having crushed that virus and leaving it in the East, um, which it turns out uh, that uh, there's a lot of antibodies shared between CoV-2 and CoV-1, so that accounts for why Taiwan has had, you know, no, no mitigation strategies, no masking, no, no uh, testing, and very low death and very low infection rates. You know, it's very interesting. But anyway, for whatever reason, this... Plans were not deployed in 2006, 2009, 2000, 2000, 2003. So they had to wait 14 years for just the right moment. And uh, then, then the, earlier this year, it was just a lot of panic, you know. And I think, I think in many ways, the Trump administration uh, deserves a lot of the uh, blame for this because they, the Trump administration was the first to panic. Uh, with the, the cut off of flights from China, which I guess Americans don't care about that. They're like, oh, screw those Chinese people, you know, whatever. But it was a really unprecedented, like travel restrictions, who ever heard of such a thing? Um, then South by Southwest was canceled on March 8th. And that's when I, well, I wrote my first article on this January 27th. I just said, listen, I don't believe we're going to experience widespread quarantine. But just so you know, they can do this to you. This is the, it's there. It can happen. And I remember people calling me saying, that's crazy. Why would you write such an insane article? We didn't even have SARS-CoV-2. Well, it turned out we did, right? I mean, the last couple of days, we got an article, big article in, in Nature somewhere saying that we've had it, you know, based on samples of uh, people giving blood in January. It's, 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 the COVID-19 COVID is already circulating in the U.S. in January. 
So my first article on this was January 27th. My second article was March 8th because I was outraged at what was happening to South by Southwest. I mean, in retrospect, there wasn't any of the vulnerable populations attending that meeting. And as you know, then March 12th came, you know, in Trump's big announcement, no more flights from Europe, Australia, UK. Whoa, that's weird. Uh, so everybody panicked when they, they got on planes and they came to the U.S. and they crowded into all the airport terminals and stood shoulder to shoulder for eight hours. <laughs> Not so much for social distancing, but um, that was a disaster. And then, and then I guess the Trump administration threw its weight behind, you know, massive lockdown school closures and everything like that. And didn't change it, they didn't change their minds until something like mid-April when Trump began to realize we might be being gaslighted here. But by that time, lockdowns were the, the orthodoxy. Yeah. Um, so here we are, uh, 10 months, 11 months later. Um, are you surprised that so many Americans are still going along with some of this stuff? Oh, I'm amazed. I, if you had told me in March that we'd still be doing this in December, I wouldn't have believed you. I'm so naive. I remember on April 3rd, the Imperial College came out with its first uh, very precise estimates of who the vulnerable populations were and who was not vulnerable. It turns out, you know, you know the story. The risk mm -hmm. of the elderly is a thousand times more uh, more than the risk of the young. And it's not even about age, really. It's about the health of the immune system. But I looked at that report from the Imperial College and went, whew, finally, finally we're going to get some, some rationality here and open up like just like we handled every previous pandemic, you know, 68, 69, 57, 58, 40, 48, 52, and, and so on. Even 1929 saw a pandemic. And we never closed down things for them. Um, we learned after after 1918 that 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 these mitigation strategies don't work. They're medieval and uh, pointless. So I thought, as we, uh, from from October 3rd on, that the New York Times would reveal, you know, the 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 who the vulnerable populations were, the very low percentage for most people to even be affected by the thing, and and everything would go away. Um, so. It became very confusing to me why, first of all, that study wasn't widely reported. And then and then we saw this strange um, evolving rationale for the lockdowns, right? Initially, it was two weeks of slow spread. Then it became slow and spread just end by itself. But, you know, the, the, every time you see, see those curves on national television, you know, the, the volume of the curve is the same. And it's, it's unclear, like, why? what is the point of prolonging the pain, actually? I mean, this is a prolong the pain strategy. Why are we doing this? Um, and then it became, well, so... Um, slowing the spread became an end in itself, and then it became stop the spread, and then it became, oh, drive the R naught below one, and then the virus magically goes away, which is a classic case of missing up cause and effect. You know, that was that was just a methodological error. And then finally it became wait for the, wait for the um, vaccine, and that's where we are today. Amazing. Yeah. Um, l let me ask you about the media, <laughs> and, and social media for that matter. Um, how, how complicit are they in the hysteria that's going on in this country right now? I mean, I, I put on Morning Joe for about 10 minutes this morning and boom, boom, that's all they were doing. Yeah. But, you know, if if I drive around Tampa, Florida, life is life is normal. If, if you're mm -hmm. if you don't turn on cable news, you, you don't even know any of this. You don't even know there's a pandemic. Yeah. So I think the media operates in a very peculiar way in which people don't understand. One is that we have a 24-7 media and thousands of outlets and they're all desperate for traffic. So, And panic always fuels that traffic. So there's that. But there's another thing. Uh, journalists are ultimately careerists and they know that one error can actually ruin their career and they all want to work for the New York Times. So what that means in effect is that the New York Times becomes the kind of arbiter of what the line of the day is. And on February 27th, uh, my friend Michael Barbaro over there at uh, the New York Times Daily Podcast, which has like 3 million listeners, I mean, it's a viral platform, interviewed Donald McNeil, um, a lead virus reporter for the New York Times, and uh, a man who has that position because he has a degree in rhetoric from Berkeley uh, University. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, he said that, that this virus is really bad because it reminds him of 1918. So it probably has a, a 3% uh, case fatality rate. Um, and so that means that, I forget what his line was, like one in six of your friends die. And uh, and and Michael Barbaro says, that's, that's terrifying. That means a total of, and then McNeil cut him off and said, you do the math. 
and then they moved on. Well, I did the math. It's 6.6 .6 million Americans, right? I mean, that's what he was predicting. <laughs> and all because this reminds him of 1918. That, that podcast was a weird experience because I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of uh, the center left, um, what used to be the center left ideology of the New York Times, but I've always respected the New York Times. I still respect the New York Times. So that was very un New York Timesy uh, of them to fuel this kind of wild panic. And that's really what they sought, sought to do. So at that moment, I turned it off and I never listened to it again. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't feel like I needed that nonsense in my head. I wanted to be able to think clearly. So I just, I bailed on that uh, podcast. But oh. but that, I think that podcast was what set the, the tenor and the tone for, for everything. It took a couple of three weeks, but eventually the, the media got behind panic porn. And that was it. This is a very irresponsible media, very unlike what, for example, we dealt with in 68, 69, and 57, 58, where the New York Times said, if you get sick, see your doctor. Other than that, don't disrupt society. Let's, let's be mature adults about this and use good public health strategies. Uh, we know how to deal with viruses. We understand respiratory illnesses, so don't panic. Just go about your life, and we're going to get we're going to get this right. There, and each of those previous two pandemics, they wrote one editorial. That was it. Otherwise, it wasn't in the news at all. And still, we had Woodstock. We had, you know, all the, you know, life went on as normal, even though those were qu quite deadly. Um, once you adjust for population, uh, arguably deadlier uh, pandemics than we're facing. Right, and those were influenza pandemics. They were influenza. One was the Asian flu, the other was the Hong Kong flu. Yeah. One killed 100,000 Americans, the other killed 110,000 Americans, but with a much lower population and, very critically, a uh, population that wasn't nearly as, as elderly, uh, much less having anywhere near the comorbidities uh, that we have uh, today. So mm -hmm. adjusting for all those factors, uh, yeah, look, I don't want to say, oh, this is worse, this is worse, but those right. were bad, bad right. times. But we didn't, we didn't, we used, we used public health uh, back then. Uh, this idea of locking down is really unprecedented, and I, I just wish that people would admit this. You know, this it's very frustrating to me because the other day, uh, Scott Atlas, you know, resigned his post at the Corona uh, Task Force you know, because the time was running out and he was ready to move on with life. And the New York Times ran an article and they treated him like some sort of freak, like a, like a weirdo, like a libertarian radical who this, you know, who's taking outrageously radical positions that that nobody agreed with. It's just not true. I mean, everything Scott Atlas recommended and from the time he got to the White House, which I think it was like in August, um, accorded with traditional public health measures, you know? You figure out who the vulnerable people are and you protect them using intelligence and, and rationality. And otherwise, you need the society to go on and eventually, you know, you reach herd immunity and, and life moves forward. That was Scott's position. But the New York Times act like, you know, acts like he, he was a crazy man for opposing lockdowns. But lockdowns on the scale have never been tried before. And the New York Times continued to pretend as if this is all just good science in operation. It's just not. It's terrible science. And every day we're discovering new things. You know, one in four young people considered committing suicide. There's mass despair and alcoholism. All the things that AIR was predicting back uh, in, um, in March have all, all come true. And more than 100,000 businesses destroyed, you know, um, are, are human rights violated, you know, and people separated from their families, uh, lost jobs. Uh, despair, uh, being muscled, our church is padlocked. I mean, it's like it's unbelievable mm -hmm. what they've done, and, and they're, and and we're going to have to come to terms with this. We can't continue to pretend this is normal. It's not normal. Yeah. Um, now the co the cost of the lockdowns is 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 if it's not fully present now, it's going to be in the future, and we're and we're going to see the government panic over all that and come in the future. But your organization, the American Institute for Economic Research, published a report that – can you share some of the costs that are going to be an outcome out of these lockdowns? Sure. I didn't – I don't have the report in front of me, but but the spreading of, of poverty around the world among children is, is uh, like nothing we've seen. I mean, we've made so much progress against hunger in the world, and mm -hmm. that's just all reversed in 2020. It's just like we've been set back 10 years in terms of our – progress. They missed vaccines. There's something like 40% of the vaccines have been missed. Cancer screenings missed. We could be seeing outbreaks of um, polio. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, fortunately, I don't think we're going to have a smallpox problem yet because we've probably got herd immunity there, but polio could come back. I mean, 
and the the number of people dying from 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 cancer in 2021 is going to be a, a real shock. Um, we saw uh, 350 hospitals in this country furlough workers during the middle of uh, the lockdowns, which is the strangest thing, because you would think, you know, with all the talk about hospitalizations and you know, in the middle of a pandemic, you would expect that that um, supply and demand would adjust the other direction. There'd be a greater demand for hospitals as well, but. Most governors implemented this strange thing where they wanted to preserve all the hospitals for COVID patients, and so non-essential uh, surgeries were were banned. I mean, yeah. so to, 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 you know, dentistry declined by seventy percent between April and August. I mean, so people didn't go to the dentist. You know, you have a root canal, you're going to suffer. I mean, it's very interesting because Donald McNeil on February 27th, same day as that podcast, wrote an editorial for the New York Times called to, to deal with COVID-19, we should go medieval. Well, we did. We uh, uh, we blamed the, the Jews in New York for spreading disease. <laughs> we got rid of dentistry. <laughs> we, we ran away from the disease like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like it was uh, like it was a miasma. We're hang hanging leper bells on people's necks, you know, <laughs> forcing them to quarantine. So, yeah, yeah. we are in full medieval. <laughs> you have to start wearing the plague mask. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it's 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 funny, but it's so tragic at the same time. It's, you know, what what are we thinking? Um, yeah, and it, it's really difficult. And I can tell you this, that uh, I, I've been so alarmed this year just just answering that that one question critical question, why? Why did this happen, you know? And uh, I'm not sure I have an answer, but I tell you what's really alarming is when I talk to uh, top officials at the White House, um, top epidemiologists at, at the most prestigious universities in the world, and they ask me, why did this happen? That is creepy, because I keep thinking somebody's going to have the answer. and. Uh, when people come to me asking me that question, I don't really know. I mean, I think my answer is unsatisfying. I think it was just a combination of political panic. There was a little bit of a let's get Trump kind of attitude. There was a Batman, you know, sort of, or who's that guy, Joker, you know, that just, mm -hmm. let's just watch the world burn. <laughs> attitude, you know, that was uh, prevalent, you know. And there was also, I think, there was an intellectual problem. There was a real burning desire on the part of a lot of uh, these modelers and uh, people who invented the epidemiological profession that they just wanted to try out their new theories, you know? Uh, these are people who've never cured anybody, and they've never dealt with a pandemic before. They were completely inexperienced at it, you know, whether they're from Johns Hopkins or Harvard. Um, these people have never had, had any experience, unlike, say, Donald Henderson. They've never had any experience in this. Exactly. Maybe, that's, they're in charge. maybe that's what they want. They want to be the next D.A. Henderson. Something like that, but nobody can handle a, a hold a candle to this guy. In fact, I have a friend of mine who's a very prominent, um, very important epidemiologist who said, who told me, she said, uh, you know, if Donald Henderson had been here, this never would have happened. But with his passing in 2016, we really did lack uh, somebody with a level of sort of awesome credentials and experience of of him to to really weigh in and stop it. So, you know, the, a lot of the people who are in a position to stop it were kind of uh, a big deal 15 years ago in the profession, but by 2020, they had been sort of displaced. And I'll mention one name in particular. Her name is Sunetra Gupta of Oxford. She's really, I would say, that the world's greatest living, I guess you would say, theoretician of, of uh, infectious diseases. Um, but she's been she's kind of been sidelined by the profession. She even herself has a hard time getting papers published during the craze for modeling that's taken over uh, the profession. So even her voice wasn't big enough. And it became so frustrating at some point because the media only wanted to interview uh, the lockdowners, you know, and, and um, um, you know, at, at some point, uh, what's his name, the doctor, David Katz, who's was also a similar candidate for being able to stop the lockdowns. He wrote an article for the New York Times, I think it was published March, I'm going to say 16th, which is, I think, the last sort of reasonable op-ed that the New York Times published on the topic, after which they published nothing. Even he was sidelined by all these people, you know, just, just and no longer interviewed by the media. Once they got their line, they knew who they're going to make famous and who they were going to deprecate. Mm -hmm. So it became really, a major problem. So by 
September, late September, uh, a lot of these people who had been sidelined by the by the media and so on uh, decided. Well, they came and visited us here at our um, at the American Institute for Economic Research, and we just kind of sat around, convention for three days about you know this disaster. And one of them, Martin Kuldor from Harvard, said, "Look, we've got to do, we've got to do something about this." So why don't we hold a conference? I said, when? He said, next weekend. Oh, great. Yeah, how are we going to do that? <laughs> uh, well, he brought in Jay Bhattacharya from, from Stanford, who's been right. working with, with uh, Ioannidis, um, who John Ioannidis, also from Stanford, who by now had gotten so frustrated with American culture and being smeared by the press. And he's the guy who wrote that March article saying, we're, 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 we're taking a disastrous road. It's going to create a catastrophe. But by, by September, he was fed up and went to go see his mother in Greece. And that's where he's been ever since. He just didn't, <laughs> didn't want to have anything to do with America anymore. Uh, but Kuldorf, Bhattacharya, and Gupta from the UK uh, came here. And then um, and they were very sweet about it because their view was, look, we have a problem with the press. These reporters don't understand public health. They don't understand cell biology. And they need to learn about it. It was a very earnest kind of belief. There wasn't... It was, Really, uh, in, in, to Kuldor's mind, this was not anything other than an intellectual confusion. And what they needed was somebody to, somebody with people with competence to sit around and talk to some top journalists for three days, two days, really, um, about these things so they could go back and report uh, some reasonable stuff. One was from British Medical Journal, the other was from a, a very prominent writer for the New York Times, um, David Zweig. And independent journalist, but, but he writes for the New York Times, and and John Tamney from Real Clear uh, Markets, and and a few other journalists came in, and we had a wonderful meeting. It was really very exciting, especially in those days, because you know we were right on the precipice at that point. You know, like more lockdowns, are we going to open up? Which way are we going to go? And of course, we we're also beating up against the election, so that was uh, that was a factor mm -hmm. there too. Um, we tried to be as non-political as possible, um, but. By the end of the two days, they said, look, we need to come out with some kind of statement. We've got to get, through, we've got to cut through the mainstream media here with a, with a clear statement. And and the result was the Great Barrington Declaration, which which came out, I guess, two days later in the morning. And we invited um, people around the world. So since then, some 40,000 medical professionals and scientists have signed it, some 700,000 citizens around the world. We now have a map up on the website showing where all the people are. So pleased to see thousands of people in China sign it, for example. Mm -hmm. it's really very nice. And it, it was a very interesting kind of um, strategy because the statement, if you read the statement, it's, it's, it's nothing other than the basics of cell biology, public health, and a call for, for society to start going back to normal functioning. That's all it really said, but it somehow mm -hmm. it created this astonishing frenzy. I remember Jay Bhattacharya that night said, look, this is so great. We're going to we're going to get a million signatures. And I remember kind of laughing. <clears throat> he doesn't understand the Internet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this is we're going to release this and we'll be lucky to get, you know, a few hundred uh, looks at it. And it go on. Well, it blew up. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that it did seem to make a pretty big difference. It, it made some, but I think um uh the mainstream squash it as quickly as they could yeah 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 in fact they they keep squashing it this morning there's some conspiracy theorist online who writes for a publication called the byline times which you've never heard of i never heard of it either he said he's discovered that the great branch in declaration was supported by the ministry of defense of the u.s of the united kingdom I was like, well, that is going to be an interesting article. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't even understand it. I went through this whole thinking there. I was like, this is the strangest thing I think I've ever read. But then when you type, type Gray Branton Declaration um, into Google today, his article is the very first link. So I don't know how that happens. I guess mm -hmm. you know how that happens. But it's, <laughs> well, it, uh, one of the issues, and I really want to get your thoughts on this, I, I know you're not, I don't believe you're a scientist, right? No. No. Um, but, you know, there's not all, and we kind of just talked about it, not all the public health experts agree. Um, we got the great Barrington uh, folks. We have you know, the late D.A. Henderson and what he formerly wrote. Um, even the 2017 CDC documents concerning this stuff did not even promote masks for community. That's true. Uh, for for healthy people, um, however, 
I like to I like to know what your thoughts are about what what has happened to the state of science because it, it seems like if you're not on board with the one <laughs> the one thought that's going on, no dissenting of thoughts are allowed anymore. In is that science? Uh, no, it's not. And in fact, all my epidemiological, immunological, uh, public health friends are more concerned about this than than even the lockdowns. They're concerned about the status of science because it, their big concern is that it's been it's being completely discredited. You know um, that 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 science has been invoked for for the shattering of everybody's lives in, in unprecedented ways, and people are going to lose faith in science as a result. And and also the censorship that goes on. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking. Even just this morning, I shared a CDC uh, a link to a link to a CDC report on on the risk of, uh, of fatalities per age. You know, so you know, under 20, it's like 99.9999. You've seen the data. Right. And somebody tried to share this on Facebook and Facebook immediately kicked it out and said, this is fake news. It's been refused <laughs> by the fact checkers. Well, what, what what could that possibly mean? Uh, 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 and so, I mean, the censorship, and you know about all the takedowns for YouTube. I mean, it's it's just out of control. Um, if anything goes viral on YouTube now, it's just, uh, that t doesn't take the pro-lockdown line. It just, it's just taken down, you know, just routinely. Um, I had a friend whose entire Vimeo account was deleted uh, a few days ago. Um, you know, these people's lives uh, embedded in this work are suddenly uh, face, facing this, this astonishing censorship. Now, things are starting to break through a little bit. Um, in the last week, the British Medical Journal ran a really good article today raising the very point that you just made, that science is really never settled. It's it's always open, that we need to have a, a open discussion and not censorship. So that was uh, encouraging. Scientific American ran a piece uh, three days ago. That was a, a good article. The Lancet um, two weeks ago ran a, a nice interview with uh, Martin Kulldorff. So they're starting to get a respe some, some respectful attention. That, that has to happen because because what these what these people have done is so horrifying. I mean, like, like really, a human rights crimes. You know, crimes against humanity. I mean, it's like unbelievable what they've done. And now you got the court decisions coming out saying, okay, you can't do that. That's dictatorship. This is a violation of people's rights. This is contrary to the First Amendment. You know, we're getting all these court cases that are pointing. At some point, uh, the major scientific journals are going to have to roll back everything that they've done. Uh, this year, and YouTube's going to have to roll it back, and Google's going to have to roll it back, and they're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out their own uh, exit plan from this while never admitting error. So that we're going to be watching some pretty fancy dance that dance steps over the next six months. Like, how do you go back to normal life while pretending that nothing really weird happened, while also introducing people to the real science here? Major problem here, I must admit to you, is, is Fauci. I don't know if you saw his interview on uh, Face the Nation this Sunday. Now, if you know anything about uh, uh, the great Dr. Fauci, he's first and foremost a, a performance artist, right? He doesn't doesn't read the journals, doesn't doesn't keep up with the research. He, he just he's just loquacious and has a kind of lockdown narrative, and he just wakes up in the morning and he has his assistant check his schedules and he goes on all the major networks and. And babbles on, uh, like 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 you know, and and manages to pull off this this routine like some sort of uh, family doctor, you know, sort of thing that he does. But um, on Face the Nation the other day, um, I just listening to it. Um, I mean, he must have said like sixteen untruths, or at least challengeable statements in the course of uh, like eight minutes. You know, whether it was about the accuracy of PCR testing, uh, the possibility of asymptomatic spread. The, the the workability of mitigation efforts like social distancing, uh, the science on masks, uh, travel bans. What else did he get wrong? Oh, the risk to children, which if you're listening to him, it sounded like it was just as uh, terrible as it was for adults. He was stating speculative science about long COVID that has no uh, real basis in science. He claimed that lockdowns work, where actually we have 22 studies showing there's no correlation between lockdowns and and lives saved. So, I mean, like everything he said was either challengeable or just patently false, but he isn't, 
he doesn't seem to care. I mean, it's like his his more he's more interested in 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 uh, in his status as a television star than he is in in the science. And I know this for a fact. I mean, the Corona uh, Coronavirus Task Force meetings, which everybody hated and p- people tried to miss because they're so dreadful, it was just consisted of Atlas and and Fauci arguing with each other with Burks, you know, in the background. Um, and and by the way, Burks, you know, I'm sure she's just a a wonderful lady in many ways, but um, it's it's been said that she has the science, she, she she has the sophistication of a third grade science teacher. I mean, it's basically, I'm, I'm sorry, to, I, you if you want to cut that out of your podcast, you're fine, but I'm just... No, 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 that's fine. I, I've never heard it, so I like to hear more about it. Yeah, um, but anyway, that's the, sort of the wrap on you know, God Again, God bless her, right? Um, but mm-hmm. she doesn't have any uh, business being in that position. But people would show up to these meetings with suitcases full of the latest science, Uh uh, showing that there's a problem with lockdowns, that masks probably don't mitigate the virus, that uh, that these that the poor are suffering terribly, that children can't be out of school. I mean, they're ruining their lives. That teenagers are suicidal. You know that there's actually no evidence. Look at this latest study from Wuhan. There's no evidence of threat. Here's a study out of the military that shows that it's track, trace, and isolate doesn't do anything to mitigate the disease, and so on and so on. Fauci had no time, no time. Uh, you present him these studies, shove them right under his nose. He'd look at him, push him aside, and say, "Well, I know the jury's out on a lot of these things." Wouldn't even look at him. So these well, are the kind of professionals we've had running this uh, lockdown policy. I mean, Fauci's been doing this for forty years. He's, he's a professional politician slash bureaucrat. And that's what he's been. I'm, I'm sure he's a brilliant doctor. I'm not going to question that. Yeah. But well, it, what's interesting about about him, his training is in immunology, which immunology. you think you think that like I. The very first thing I did when this whole thing happened is I decided to bone up in my knowledge. And so I read Cell Biology for, for Dummies. And uh, I learned in there that uh, there's only that, that viruses go away uh, through herd immunity. It can be obtained either through naturally acquired immunities or vaccines. And that's how, we, that's how humanity deals with viruses. There wasn't a word in there about lockdowns. <laughs> so I don't understand why an immunologist like Fauci would be saying the things he says. But what's really important is... Uh, what I think um, what we might have we're looking at here is an overspecialization. Like public health as a discipline looks holistically, you know, right. at the psychological costs of the loss of freedom, uh, you know, the the burden of separating families, you know, the the devastation that comes with job loss, and those are all part of public health considerations. But if you're an immunologist, you're only concerned about one thing, and that's the bug. This one bug. And um, this creates a kind of myopia to the to larger effects on society in general. There was a three Belgian doctors in 2011 wrote an article that was published by the World Health Organization saying uh, there's a lot of talk about virus preparedness. And they said, based on our experience from H1N1 in 2009, when every government in Europe, not in the U.S., but in, the, in Europe went crazy, started shipping ventilators all over the place and and, and masks all over the you know, billions of dollars flowing all over to prepare for the pandemic that never came. They said, you know what our problem is? We have too much preparedness. We're too prepared for the next. We're so prepared for the next uh, bug that we're, we're desperate for it. And there's a whole industry that's lying in wait. And the World Health Organization named these highly specialized uh, people like Im- immunologists together with disease modelers and who won't surprise you, the media, which the World Health Organization said is just desperately hungry for this kind of panic porn. And finally, this won't surprise you, the pharmaceutical industry, which stands to gain tremendously financially by distribution of a new virus, whether it works or not. So that was 2011. They warned that that um, unless we stopped being prepared for the next virus, that, that, that there will come a time when a pathogen will arrive and the whole world will freak out and flip out and will destroy society as we know it. Sure enough, that's what happened. All right. So where do you see this going? What, what, what's our future? Short term, long term? Short term, I think between now and uh, the end of February, we're going to continue with this, you know, wake up, read the daily newspapers and find out, you know, how many people we're allowed to have in our homes kind of thing. Um, you know, are we going to lock down? You know, the, the kids, are they going to be going to school for two days and come back for three days? And then, you know, by the way, one in four women have changed their life plans right now, married women with children, because they, they had to quit work to take care of the children. Now now they're rethinking everything about professional life. It's, it's God, what a catastrophe. So long-term damage here is just grim. But between now, I say, in, in late January, we're not going to see much change, except 
that there's the truth is going to be coming out of in dribs and drabs. You know, the New York Times is going to run more articles about acquired immunities, about the absence of asymptomatic assist, uh, symptomatic spread, about the inaccuracies of PCR testing. We're going to get these articles not on the front page, but on page 10, and they'll be more or less accurate. And we're going to start seeing it slowly uh, roll back. By February 1st or something like that, we'll probably be, be in full um, anti-lockdown uh, mode. And there'll be you know more talk about movie theaters and sports opening up, and, and Broadway will probably open up by the summer and that sort of thing. So I'm guessing that, um, oh, and the other thing about the vaccine, a lot of people are really worried about the idea of universal imposition of vaccines. The, the, the problem with that is like, even for these sadistic lockdowners, that's implausible. There, there are two people, there are two broad groups out there. Those for whom the vaccine will not have an effect because their immune systems are too broken down to respond to a vaccine. It, you know, that's how vaccines work. They give your immune functioning immune system a kick to give it a little bit of a boost. If your immune system is not functioning, the vaccine will not work for you. We don't know what percentage of the people died from COVID-19 for whom that applies, but let's just say it's, you know, 20% is it 80%, I don't know. And there's another group out there that are far better off just getting naturally acquired immunities or depending on their cross immunities from other coronaviruses and for whom this virus is not a danger at all. It's barely a disease at all. Now, now imagine a Venn diagram. There's a small group in the middle for whom the vaccine is going to be very valuable probably. And some of those people are healthcare workers and, and some of them are in retirement communities and some of them are, you know, uh, frontline doctors and that kind of stuff. And they'll get the vaccine first. So I'm guessing that and there'll be millions and millions, tens of millions distributed uh, around the world. Uh, but after probably 5% um, are, uh, have the vaccine, we're going we're gonna to call it a done. And we're going to see cases starting to fall because testing is going to fall. And deaths will have leveled off. They've already become endemic in most parts of the world. You know, right. the viruses don't disappear. They just become endemic. Um, and and so by by February, uh, we're going to start seeing people saying, well, we, we won. We beat, we beat the virus. You know, we've, we've figured it out now. And now we're going back to normal life. Uh, between now and then, you know, I think the, the, the biggest problem we're going to have are things like, you know, dealing with suicides and missed cancer screenings and missed vaccines and, and kids uh, living in despair and and family shattered, and we're going to be dealing with the social consequences of this uh, for the rest of the year after 2021, and then it's probably going to uh, last 10 years. By 10 years from now, you won't find anybody who will claim they ever favored lockdowns. Yeah, that's that's how it works sometimes. I don't doubt that. I, and I hope you're right. Sooner than 10 years. It might be more like five. Um, I, the analogy here is the Iraq war, right? I mean, so we went to war went to war in Iraq, it was, I, I think everybody recognizes what a disaster that was. Right. It took but, but 20 the, years later for, for people to, for that to become the orthodoxy that this is a mistake. But, I'm presuming that, that history is working on fast forward now, so it might be. Yeah. Time. No, that's interesting because, I mean, I remember at the time, if you were in the Iraq war, you, you were a very small minority, right? And now that's the prevailing wisdom, that's right. you know, this many years later. You're, you're, right. you're absolutely right. People were shouting you down. Uh, oh, yeah. And if you said, well, I don't think it was good to invade Iraq because I don't think they had weapons of mass destruction. It's like, why are you defending a brutal, brutal dictator? Mm -hmm. why, are you, why are you so in favor of Saddam, Saddam Hussein? It's like, well, I'm not. Well, it's the same thing now. You know, you advocate uh, focused protection, the Great Branton Declaration, and they're like, why do you want gra your, grandmother to, your grandmother to die? You know, so it's just the, the debate is completely out of control at this point. You know, we're not even, oh, we don't have a rational debate on it. Oh, I mean, you you brought up Scott Atlas uh, a little earlier, and it's like I don't know if you were watching or paying attention to the Twitter when he put in his resignation. Mm -hmm. These people were brutal. Take away his medical license. Stanford shouldn't take him back. I'm wow. like, I mean, you don't have to you don't have to agree with them, but why 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 all the bile? You know, I don't get it. It's hard to hard to account for, especially given how well he knew the science. Like I've had talks with a lot of people out there in very important positions. Uh, Scott Atlas beats them all in terms of his no knowledge of the literature, his ability to understand the facts, his the way he devours all the latest research in the medical journals. I mean, that guy is just a, 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 an intellectual wonder. 
and and God bless him, he actually changed uh, Trump's mind, you know, uh, on all this because Trump was, let's face it, just very confused all the way between yeah. February and uh, and about August until Scott Ellis got there. And um, wow, there's a lot I would say about that. I'm not sure what I can and cannot say, so I'll probably just. Leave yeah. it. <laughs> but one thing I would like to say is, um, I, I know. The, the media's methodology with Scott Atlas is he's a radiologist. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the argument now or, or has been. And, yeah. But well, and, and in fact, he's written t uh, two books on public health. Um, and, and that's something Fauci has never done. You know, public health is a special thing. It's a special discipline. And uh, Scott Atlas is a, a massive expert in that topic. He understands holistically what it means to have a healthy society and what to do, how to, how to obtain that and what not to do, what to do. So in a sense, his credentials were, were leagues above everybody else on that, um, on the Corona uh, uh, task force. And extraordinarily, do you know that the task force doesn't have a single epidemiologist on it? Not one. I didn't know. Yeah. There, there, there was the one guy, the Admiral, I don't know his name, he, he seemed to be pretty knowledgeable about testing and that stuff. The, the guy with the white hair. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I paid little attention to Burks or Fauci, honestly. And, and the, the politics of this thing are really, really bizarre because you can look back in late February and see that slate psychology today. Um, many other of these sort of what, what I would consider like center left uh, Journals of Opinion, a salon, uh, which is kind of far left, uh, we're all saying, oh, calm down. This is all going to be fine. This is a virus. We've dealt with viruses before. And the right wing in those days was all apocalyptic. God is punishing us uh, for our sins. You know, there's there's an apocalyptic element on the right. And so gradually, late February and early April, the side switched, right? And... Um, what explains that? Uh, well, I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, the left wanted to take a position that Trump was not taking, right? So Trump was in the big lockdowner, right? So then they became, they were like, oh, stop being foolish. It's just ridiculous. You know, you anti-science weirdos want to lock everything down. And then when Trump decided to open up by Easter, they're like, wait, no, we should lock down. So they just flipped sides. <laughs> Just for purely political reasons. I, I would love to rerun 2020 without the politics and see what it looks like. You know, a nice counterfactual. <laughs> find out what kind of world we'd be living in today without uh, without all the politics. Trump himself changed his mind. The funny thing about him is that initially it was like, oh, China's getting getting us with this virus, you know. It's like, down with you, but bad Chinese, you know. You're trying to get back at me with for, for the tariffs. I just, Hard to imagine anybody would think that way, but he did. Um, but by middle of middle of April, he was like, "Wait a minute! I built the world's strongest economy, and now I've unplugged it. Uh, how do I know I'm not being gaslighted by the left here?" And so he began to think this was a conspiracy. You know, he went back to his January position, which is that there's no big deal. So, but he didn't really have a he didn't really have a clear rationale. It, so he languished between all between April. And, and August with having no theory or understanding of this at all. It was just completely, he decided a lot of times he decided to stop thinking about it. You know, he stopped tweeting about it, you know? Well, and then I, think he, that, I think that might've been his downfall too. Yeah, yeah. And then he just put all of his hopes in the vaccine. And by the time Scott Atlas got there and Scott began to, to tell him to explain the science to him, then he, he shaped up and got better. But then the better Trump got, the worse the left got. And that basically, takes us from August all the way to, to, to November. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just been a crazy time where people just making up science based on uh, however they want to position themselves. That's not the way you do science. That's just, it's an, it's an embarrassment. Well, let me uh, go ahead and close with this. Um, I want to give you some time to talk about your new book. It came out, okay. I think, September, Liberty or Lockdown. Yeah. Give, give the so, audience a taste. Yeah, thank you. So I, 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 um, I've been chronicling this since, you know, since, since January. And then really, I guess the book starts with my writings in, in March, <laughs> going through the, uh, the, um, the epistemological crisis, which I think is the way this all began, you know, with the lack of testing. And that's the opening chapter. 
it was like, what happens when you don't have a test and everybody's scared? Do I have it? Do I not? How do I find out? And that kind of prepared the way for the political panic, uh, which I talk about in some detail. But I think the best chapters of the book are the ones where I go through previous pandemics. I go through uh, 57 and 68 and 48 and polio and smallpox and Asian flu and Hong Kong flu, the eradication of smallpox, the, 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 the origins of inoculation in the 18th century, and so on. So I have a lot of history, a lot of the history of the lockdown is in there, which I think is uh, probably the best uh, part of the book. I talk about a lot of the costs of lockdowns, and the book ends with a real cry for, uh, for an overtly anti-lockdown kind of social, cultural movement that we have to have because we can't ever allow this to happen again. And I hope when we come out of this, it's going to be less, oh, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. You know, let's, let's just move on. What we need is a, a firm con commitment on the part of our, uh, on the part of the ruling class to never do anything like this again. We cannot repeat this again. It, was, it just can't be allowed. I mean, businesses won't start up again. You know, people won't send their kids to school anymore. I mean, it's a, We've got to have ironclad promises that we can have a normal society again. Whatever your politics are, we've got to start respecting human rights and and, and permit and protect a functioning society in, during the next epidemic, or else we're going to continue to deal with the psychological um, and political fall and economic fallout of this thing for, for decades to come. So that's how the book winds up. I think it's really passionate. It has 250 footnotes, so you can check everything in there. I was really scrupulous about citing every bit of work that I could, especially all the chapters in which I, I go through the the uh, uh, the silliness of lockdowns. There's no relationship whatsoever between uh, these extreme uh, measures, we've stringencies that we've used, and death saved. And I try to demonstrate that uh, through citing all kinds of studies. So all the research is in there. I put the book out because these for for mostly for worse, but sometimes for better, the most exciting times of my life. You know, I've learned more this year than I ever thought I've learned, uh, would learn in a lifetime about these really important aspects of public health that I didn't know that much about before. So it's been a learning experience. It's been a terrifying experience to wake up every day and just feel like you're living in a nightmare, but then, but then getting yourself out of bed and fighting it. I've learned so much about myself and others and and uh, the urgent <laughs> of, of public advocacy, you know, it's it's just been uh, a remarkable time for all of us. So for those of us who survived with our sanity intact, I think we're going to be stronger than ever and more prepared to deal with all the exigencies of the, of the future. Well, good stuff. And I'll go ahead and link to the book in the show notes. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Jeffrey Tucker, for sharing your thoughts with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me uh, speak with you. Thank you.